All right, so our reading today, uh, our, our main scripture reading comes from Exodus. And you're going to hear about a guy named Moses. And I want you to focus on, so rather than me give you this prolonged background information on Moses and all this other stuff going on, I want you to just bear in mind a couple things. God is calling Moses to do something, to go to the people who are in, trapped in Egypt. Okay, He's calling him to do something, and Moses has a lot of buts, okay? a lot of excuses. And um, I want you to see if you can catch all of them. There's about five of them that he, excuses that he makes. All right, so Moses, and, and by the way, Moses is like the, like to the Old Testament, Moses is like what Abraham Lincoln is to the presence of the United States. You know, he's like big, big, big wig, okay? Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. That would be a shocking sight. So he stops to uh, check it out and see what's going on. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So now God's telling Moses, I want you to go, I want you to speak to Pharaoh. Okay, this was like the most powerful person on the planet at the time. Okay, um, and bring my children, the, ch the children of Israel, out of Egypt. <laughs> Some small task. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, God said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God in this mountain. Um, so there's the first but. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they asked me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? I don't know who you are, God. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He, and he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. In other words, the God who's always been in existence, who is from the beginning to the end, He's the one who sent me to you. There we go. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me. Oh, another but. Uh, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. <laughs> You're making this stuff up. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> I just love when you read it. Like you Gloss over this when you read it, but sometimes when you just pull this out, it's like, dude... Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and I can't blame the Lord. And he said to him, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be your, with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. All right. Whew. So all of that. All right. So... You should, make, you should understand, the reason I'm pulling this out is I want you to understand the Bible makes it abundantly clear that, that the characters, the people in the Bible, like a lot of times people talk about the heroes of the Bible, the, you know, the, you know, the great leaders and, and all these people that are in the Bible that, that I should emulate. Well, you find out when you re actually read the Bible that the characters in the Bible, these heroes were incredibly flawed. And if anything, they, they just amplify the fallenness of humanity and the sinfulness that, that I carry within myself. You see, I have plenty of excuses why I don't want to listen to God in, in many different circumstances. There's plenty of excuses that I can, that I can come up with on a regular basis. And that's because, because of sin. Sin curves me. I like, to, I like to think of it this way. Sin curves me in on myself. And one of the symptoms of sin in my own self-centeredness is I'm constantly rationalizing you know, my rejection of God. Like, I don't need God, you know? And I've shared before at Genesis, there have been some nights where I've been like, man, <sighs> I don't feel like coming to Genesis tonight, you know? <laughs> I did that this last summer. I was like, it was beautiful outside. And I'm like, I just want to like enjoy, sit on my porch, keep my legs up and, and just enjoy this beautiful weather. 
But I went. And you know what the thing was? Is I was glad because I got to see some great people. I mean, so many of you. And I got a chance to really, you know, just kind of immerse myself in God's Word. And I needed it, you know. But that's a constant temptation to, to turn God into, a, into, a, um, into someone that just exists to serve me. And when he doesn't meet what I think I want, you know, I just kind of rationalize why um, I don't need him, why I can reject him. And so, like I said... Oftentimes, you look at people in the Bible, you look at Moses, and like, Moses like Abraham Lincoln, he's like, he's like the man. You want to you understand, like, what, the pre, like what, is a, what should a president look like? Well, look at Abraham Lincoln, right? He, like, was president during the Civil War, you know? And, and so we pick, this is what we like to do in our society. We try to pick out the people to emulate. Look at that guy. I wish I was just like him, or you should be like him. And, and Moses is very much like this, okay? He's, he's that guy that people would have looked up to, except when you actually learn about Moses, you begin to realize how flawed of an individual he was. You might be familiar with the story, whether, since I'm not like, going through the whole story of Moses and everything surrounding it, that's something I'm going to do on Tuesday. Um, but because I'm not going into the story in depth, I'll just point this out to you. There have been tons of movies about Moses and about the Exodus and about how God, um, God delivered God's, his people from the Egyptians. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with the Christian Bale movie that came out too, uh, not too long ago, Exodus. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Sorry, that's me. I'm just sharing. It, you know, but but what, what was the main point of that story? Who's the main character? Who's the hero? Moses. Well, in the Bible, that's not true. Okay? Um, you open up, you, you take up, look at some of the other things. Like my kids, they've seen them. They're like, on Netflix, you can check out The Prince of Egypt. It's a cartoon. Same story. Who's the, who's the main hero of that story? Moses. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. That's not what the Bible says. Moses isn't the main character. He's not the hero. Who's the hero? It's God. God is the one who's the hero. He's the one that calls Moses. And Moses, if anything, is a total pansy. You know, he's like, I don't want to go. I don't want to listen. And I can just go through these rationalizations really quick. And I want to help you see how we can, might, might be able to relate to these. Because I, I noticed Curtis earlier was going through some of the discussion question for the, some of the uh, focus questions for Connect later. And he was like, I don't know how, I can, how, how some of these questions might speak to me. So, rationalization number one, this is what Moses first said. He said, who am I that you would choose me? In other words, look where I've been in my life. Look what I've done. Why in the world would God choose me? I am the lowest of the low. All right. Now understand this. Humility is a good thing, and I found that it's really important to, to be humble, okay? And because as soon as I start to become too prideful, I begin to play God, right? But there's also the opposite side of the equation, there are times in life where you can like, play the humble card, like, oh, I'm such a horrible person. Look at all the things I've done, and I'm just the lowest of the low. And, and, and you begin to view yourself in this way, in such a way that you become spiritually paralyzed. In other words, I, I can't go anywhere else because I'm stuck in this spot because that's just who I am, and God could never do anything with me. You see, when, when you are brought to your knees and when you, when you realize how, how fallen you are, what that should do is that should actually drive you to God. And drive you to him. And that's what it should have done for Moses. It should have been, Lord, what do you want? I've been, I've been, and I would be happy to serve you. That's what Moses should have done, but he didn't. And you notice how God responds to him. He says, I will be with you. I will be with you. And I guess today, for, for a modern, for modern day person, for, for a Christian today, um, what does that mean for God to say this to us, to me? I am with you. To say I'm with you basically says, look, remember in all the ways that I have been with you. Remember what Jesus did, did for you on the cross. That's God giving his life for you, okay? I am with you. If you don't believe me, look to the cross and see the price, see, see the cost that, that, that was, um, the price that was paid so that, that you could be forgiven and that you could know that you have a God that, that deeply loves you. Rationalization number two. All right, I don't know you, God. <laughs> All right, so I told you humility was kind of the thing that gets drawn out, like a false sense of humility that spiritually paralyzes us when you say, you know, I'm such, you know, you can over, overdo the, my own, my own um, lack of being able to do anything. Um, I don't know you, God. I would say that that, that, that response is, comes from someone who doesn't want to change, you know? Um, I'm going to just claim ignorance on this, you know? Like, I could never know you, God, so you know what? I, I, you know, there's, there's no way that, so how can I follow you if I don't know you? Right? How could I live a, a, a godly life if I don't know you? And honestly, getting to know God is hard work. 
You know, we talk about this at our Tuesday Bible study, and we talk about this at Thursday group, and I'm sure, I know you talk about this in the women's group too. It's, it's, it takes a lot of work sometimes to get to know God, to open up a Bible, and, and to actually let go of some of those excuses and actually get into the Word. And, and, and even to do it with other people can be exhausting. It can be hard. But what does God say? <laughs> there we go. That's why I came to you basically. That's why I came to you. I came to reveal myself to you. God said to him, who do you tell the people I am? I am who I am. I was the one who's, I was here in the beginning. I created the world and I'll, I will be long, long after you're gone, <laughs> long after you've died. And once again, I guess the listening to that phrasing, that's why I came to you. I think it's important to remember that's why Jesus came, to teach me about my heavenly father. So when I say that God is love as an example, I'm not just saying it and thinking of some, like, you know, f- idea of God out there. No, I'm, I'm thinking of a very tangible picture of God, Jesus. God in human flesh. God who, who's willing to give his life for me and hang on a cross for me, okay? I came to you so that you would know me. And in Romans 1, I was going to point this out to you really quick. Romans 1, uh, let's see, verse 19, it says this. It says, what can be known about God is plain to us because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So we are without excuse. We don't have excuses to say, you know, I can't know you, God, because God has revealed himself in creation itself and also, as I said, through Jesus. And so it's not really a, it's not a, really a, a good rationalization Third one, if it comes up, there we go. People won't believe me or listen to my voice. So this would be Moses' approval idol coming out, his desire to be approved of by other people, okay? People are going to look at me and say, you're crazy. (laughs) You know, and and when I, I, this has been something that I've had to, like for a long time, getting into the Word myself, I've had to spend a lot of time and I still fail all the time. I, I've learned that it's very important for me to, to meet people where they are and not make, make assumptions about what other pe- where other people are at, you know? And, and Moses is saying, you know, people are just going to think I'm crazy. Well, that's why it's important to remember who's sending you and it's important like, that you actually think through what you're going to say, <laughs> all right? What does God say to him? Point people to the signs I give you. Well, if you want to share, share God's love with people, if you want to talk to people about the hope that God provides, what signs might I point them to? Hmm, there's a common theme coming up here. Once again, point them to Jesus. Point them to the cross. And, and, and remind, I would, that's, that's what I would do, is I would remind people that because I am so self-centered, because I'm always thinking of myself first, and oftentimes, like, oftentimes mismanaging my life and doing what I want rather than what I should be doing, um, God had to come and actually show me what selflessness looked like. It says in this is love, in, in the Bible, and this is love, not that I love God, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for my sin. Okay? And this is love, not, not my ability, it's in lo- and this is love that God showed me what love is. And that act of love offers me a new beginning, a fresh start every single day. And also the chance, the, the, the knowledge that even if I fail, even if people think I'm crazy, there will always be somebody else that I can share God's love with. Rationalization number four. I am slow of speech and tongue. <laughs> this is Moses saying, I want to be comfortable. <laughs> This is not a comfortable thing for me, Moses is saying. He's like, I'm not a natural public speaker, okay? I'm not Charlton Heston standing up with a big stick going, you know, in dramatic fashion saying, let my people go. No, it wasn't like that. <laughs> you know, that's what, it was, that's what it looked like in the movies. It wasn't Christian Bale like, with like fake like mascara and stuff on me. Like, you know, that's not what it was like. Moses, Moses was like, he was scared to talk in public. He didn't, he was not, he was not, he was a smooth talker, okay? He, wouldn't, he wasn't a guy you'd peg as, oh yeah, that guy, he's going to be a great leader. No. And Moses had all sorts of insecurities. I'm scared to go up to people and talk to them about God. I'd rather keep my faith. I'd rather keep, and, and this would be 
maybe the way I, I've thought about things, especially growing up before I was a pastor, I was oftentimes very insecure about becoming a pastor because I was scared to actually share my faith with other people and put myself out there. Because why? Well, it would make me uncomfortable. And once again, kind of going back to the previous rationalization, um, I, might not get, I might not have the approval of other people that I like. I might be met with some resistance. But what does God say? He says, I'll give you the words, and, and I'm paraphrasing basically here, but I'll give you the words through my spirit. And I would say, like he, God is basically saying to Moses, I will tell you what to say. And he really does the same thing for me today, and I believe he does that for all of us when we're seeking to sh- talk about God to other people and, and share our faith and go. That's why, that's why Bible study is so important. Getting into the Word allows us to absorb God's truth and so we can share it with other people. Okay, but we have to enter into other people's lives and understand where they are so we can actually apply that word to them. We need to actually absorb God's word and let his word into our lives so the Holy Spirit can work on my heart and so he can begin working on my life. And that brings me to the last one, rationalization number five. I don't know if this is a rationalization. It's just kind of finally all the other pretenses just kind of go out the window. It's like, I just can't do it. I don't want to do it. I just don't. At the end of the day, all these rationalizations are just kind of covering up the underlying reality that I don't want to. I don't want to. I I just don't want to. And so all these excuses I'm making to you, all these things I'm saying to you, like why I'm not here, why I'm not doing, why I'm not opening up my Bible, why I'm not working through this and listening to God's voice and, and working through things, it's all because I just don't want to. And God, I mean, in reality, God kind of just told Moses, too bad you're going. <laughs> That's kind of what he did. But, but he does do this, and I think this can be an encouragement to us today. He said, you have other people to help out. Remember when you talked about, you know, your brother, you know, you talked about you not being, you're being afraid to talk in public and all this kind of stuff. Well, guess what? There's your brother, Aaron. Guess what? He's a pretty good speaker. He'll be there to, to have your back, you know? Do you notice that God's like pointing, he's like, he's like, how, like, like, you can go and, and face the most, the most feared person on the planet, the Pharaoh of Egypt. Why? Because I am with you. Because of who I am. I am the hero of the story. Okay? That's what God says. All right? And, and at the end of the day, if you're still struggling, guess what? That's why there's so many other people around you. That's why you need a community. Okay? I just can't do it, God. I can't, I can't you know... This is why, like, this is why I think it's so important that, that Genesis community not just be a place where we're getting into, we're not we're just getting into the Word, but we're doing it together, and and we're growing in our relationships with one another. We begin to learn more about one another, and as our relationship with God grows, I say this all the time: our relationship with one another will grow too, and we'll be an encouragement to one another. You know, if you're struggling like Moses was, you have people you can talk to, and you can say, "Man, I'm struggling," and you can have a person say, "Hey, remember God's with you." You know, God offers you his love and forgiveness. There's always tomorrow. Tomorrow's a brand new day, all right? You know, what have you been saying? Like, just, just share with me. Let me help you out a little bit, you know? But at the end of the day, this is, this is really what it all comes down to. <clears throat> the point of the Bible is that we are flawed people. I am a flawed person. I'm constantly going to be finding, trying to find a way out. I'm going to constantly find a way to kind of minimize my relationship with God, push him out of the equation because, well, you know, he's really kind of an idea and this is my life, all right? But the whole point of the Bible is that no, 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 no. I'm not writing my own story. I'm part of God's story. And at the center of it is Jesus because I am a sinful, flawed human being who needs a perfect Savior. And that's exactly what Jesus was. That's exactly what he was. Um, we are full of excuses. I am full of excuses, but when I look to the cross, guess what? I'm left without excuses. Because right there, I see a God who looked at me, knows everything in my heart, and can see past. And God saw, when God looked at Moses, he saw past all of it. He knew deep down inside, Moses just didn't want to do it. And he's coming up with all these excuses. And he's, he knows the same, same thing's true about me. I find all sorts of excuses, but all of it is just covering up the reality that that I want to be my own God. And yet knowing that about me, he stretched out his arms and he died on the cross. He gave his life. He gave everything for me. Jesus didn't make any excuses. He said, Father, what do you want me to do? Those people need a Savior. And Jesus went and did it. 
God's the hero. I encourage you to bow your heads with me. And I want you to think about, we're going to confess our sins to God. And when I say sins, what I mean by this are all the ways in which we push God out and push other people out and focus primarily on ourselves. Okay? And I want you to think of the different excuses you've made in your own life to uh, not learn more about God, to not open up your Bible, and also to not love other people in your life truly and seek their greatest good. Let's bow our heads and um, let's, let's just speak to our Heavenly Father. Father, Lord, we have fallen short of your glory, of your goodness, of your perfection. Every single day, we find new and creative ways to rebel against you. We find new and creative ways to come up with excuses and rationalizations to play God. But deep down inside, Lord, we know that all of those excuses are just covering up the truth that we really do know at our core that we need you. We need you, Lord. We need your love. We need your presence. We need your strength to get through every single day. I want you to uh, just imagine all those, those things I told you about, all those, those rationalizations, all those excuses and I want you to just get them in your head and I want you to imagine yourself just laying those at the foot of the cross. Go ahead. What's beautiful about Jesus is that we are not required to find strength within ourselves to change because Jesus is our strength. I want you to just keep your eyes closed here and I want you to now imagine yourself just looking up at that cross and there Jesus is looking down on you. He is your strength. He is your hope. That's God looking down on you. He sees all of those things that you laid before him. He knows all about it and he says, I love you. You're forgiven. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, I'm going to encourage uh, our band to come up here. And, and as they're doing that, I just want you to remember that, that what Jesus does through forgiveness is what he does is he then provides us motivation to try and make some changes in our lives, to, to try and listen more clearly to God and try instead of coming up with excuses immediately but instead seek to be more faithful 